All right, everyone, how you doing today? This is class three of Audio MIDI 2 in the spring, fall of 2021 semester. But before we start, I just want to talk about like what an amazing thing that MIDI is. We don't talk about all the ramifications of MIDI, um, but MIDI can be used for so many things. We're, when we talk about MIDI in our classes, we're, we're basically talking about how we can imp we have a keyboard that inputs notes into the computer and in Pro Tools we play around with the length of the notes, the timing of the notes, the pitch of the notes. We can edit and do all sorts of stuff. We could draw in continuous control or uh, control change values or continuous controllers depending upon CC values. Uh, everybody's got a different way of talking about it, but it really actually, the original MIDI spec is control change, not continuous controllers, but that's what most people say when you hear the term CC today. Um, and, but MIDI is used f in so many different ways. Let me talk about a few ways. So one way is if you go to see a Broadway show during normal times, the lights are being changed by MIDI controls changes, right? If you go to see a live concert, a big touring act, there's a lot of MIDI going on under the hood for the lights, maybe for scene changes uh, on the mixer so that they have different mixes for each song. Maybe there's different kind of reverb in the house on the vocal for one song, and maybe they're doing an older song uh, for the next song, and it requires a different kind of reverb with your digital set up your console, you can recall these things and set them up and you can use MIDI program changes being run by a sequencer off stage to do that. So for example, there's a guy that I'm friends with on Facebook named Michael McKnight. And for the past, he does, he's not doing it anymore, but for 25 years, he would go out and set up the MIDI for, for huge touring uh, extravaganzas. You know, all these people on the level of Madonna, uh, when she was doing big stadium tours. And basically, he had a rig under the stage, and he had a redundant rig, which meant he had two laptops doing the same thing at the same time, all being controlled by time code, that he could, if one went down, he could switch to the other. And he had, he used Digital Performer because Digital Performer is a very old sequencer, a very mature package. But one thing that Digital Performer has is it has something called chunks. And you could load in 25 chunks in each one of those, or 26 chunks, or all these different chunks, and each one of those chunks is a complete sequence. So you could basically, in your one session, you could load in 25 different songs, and just by hitting a note on the on a, on a computer keyboard, or by hitting a, a MIDI control change, you can go from one uh, chunk to the next chunk and you can just cycle through your entire show and if they're playing 22 or 23 songs you can have a different chunk and so in that are uh, all the backing tracks that used to be played uh, there, there are lighting cues being sent from that mixer console changes all, all these things being done by MIDI and so over the last week I've sort of taken that concept and I've run with it a little bit and this is sort of tangential and off of the topic but I just thought I'd share some of that with you and I wasn't happy with the way that my computer screen was being captured it was a little fuzzy and and um, even when I'm looking at it on YouTube afterwards it certainly wasn't as clear as I was seeing it when I'm looking at it and basically what's happening is that I've got a, a high resolution 4k monitor it's beautiful it's huge it's 43 inches and i had it plugged into um let's see if i can do this i had it plugged into this box here and this box here is a video switcher and basically when i push these different things here it will cycle through like the different cameras i have and what i used to have was the first one here the one all, all the knob all the way on the right used to be my computer screen. So uh, I'd have my HDMI cable coming out of the computer into here. And then I'd have a pass through HDMI cable going to my monitor. And then this is USB. And then the USB output from this would carry the uh, audio because I've got the audio 
This is my audio interface that I use for class. I've got another audio interface on my rack over there that's HD that I use for when I record things that I need high quality audio. This is very good, but it's not as for audio, but it's, it's not as good as my HD interface. And so I've got the headphone output from here with everything coming out of my computer, including when you guys talk, being routed into these audio inputs here. And then that's all being routed through, oh, Profesh, just letting you know that I have to sign up early. Yeah, no worry, Caitlin. Um, no worry. So, right? So originally I had my video screen and my two cameras and the audio coming through and I do all the mixing from here. I wasn't happy with the way the screen was and I think what was happening was that my video screen was coming in here and it was being downsampled to 1080p from 4K and it was doing a crappy job of downsampling it. So what I've done and, and the way that I get that to you originally was that Zoom would see this as both an audio interface and a video interface and I would select that in Zoom. The way I make my recordings for you, and let's go back to, let's go here, is I run this software in the background, and this is going to cause some video feedback. It'll look a little weird, so don't worry about that. I'm dragging it off from another computer. Okay, I use this software and all these extra images. That's video feedback. When it's off on the side, I don't see that, right? And I use this to record and post this up on YouTube after I finish editing it. And this, I had the input set up as um, the V8, VR1, which is that video switching thing. So what I've done over the last week was I installed something here called the OBS MIDI plugin. And that enabled me to, and OBS is, a, all this is free, this software. It's really cool. And I've been using it for about a year and a half now. And I don't know everything about it, but I've learned a lot. So you could see right here, and let me zoom in on this for you. These are all the USB devices that are hooked up to my studio right now. So the YC88, that's my main keyboard controller, and it's got two additional um, uh, MIDI ports because it's a, a very sophisticated keyboard controller. Then the VR1, which is my video switcher. It's also got MIDI. It's hooked into my computer via USB. And when you see my cameras, it's coming in via USB into OBS. And then I've got this thing called Nano Control 2 and Nano Key 2. And so what I did was I've got this Nano Key. And let me zoom out and let me show you the Nano Key by switching to um, here. Right? And you're seeing my keyboard now. That's this here. Right? And you see that it's got pads on it up here like drum, like drum pads. Okay, you hear me? Okay, great. So it's got these pads up here, which are drum pads. <laughs> I set every one of those pads to transmit a different MIDI CC value, right? And so I select this and I go, let's go back to the screen. And let me zoom, get this right in the middle and zoom in. So up here it says configure Nano Key Studio. And then I, it becomes, brings this up. And then it's got a bunch of controls here at the bottom and you play around with these things. And I entered five, con five configurations, right? So control change, MIDI control. So I could use a note on the keyboard or I can use a control value. So I've got 120 transition, goes to today's stream begins shortly, VR1 solo, computer screen, computer screen, VR1 with, uh, with picture in picture, and then the post uh, the post lewd. So what that means is that when I push a key on my um, this nano key, let's say I push the first one, it'll it'll mute me because I don't have any microphone hooked up to this, but it'll go to today's stream is short. Then I push the second one and it goes to my camera and then if I want to switch cameras, I pop these, right? And then... I push the third one, it goes to my computer screen. I push the fourth one, you'll see me in the lower left right hand corner. And then if I push the fifth one, it'll go uh, copy to my copyright page. 
And that's all being done via MIDI, because this is also this uh, nano key is being is hooked up via USB. Then, in case something goes wrong with that, I've got on. Um, this is my main controller here that I when I write I use this to with these faders here. It's, as I'm playing, I do MIDI CC with modulation and expression, and I've got um, a bunch of different ones hooked up. It depends on my software, which ones I use. I just have all the ones that I mainly use. I wasn't using these last five knobs up here at the top, and I've got these set up to do the same thing. So if I do this one here, one, two, three, four, five, it'll go back to my today's stream. Me, computer screen, picture in picture, and then the Right? It's really cool. And that's all being done by MIDI. Now, on top of that, I've got an issue with my microphone. And the issue with my microphone is that if I'm playing something for my film scoring class or I'm playing something for you, I'd like to have my microphone muted because I don't want you to hear the ambient sound in the room. Or if I want to take a drink from my coffee or my tea, I don't want you to hear my slurping. It's really gross. Right? So what I did was I set up this very last one to shoot out MIDI CC127, which is not being used to switch any scenes. And then if I go back to my screen before I do this next one, you could see down here in the corner, right, I've got my different scenes all named. And I, I set that up. I programmed that in OBS. But what also I have, let me move this out of here. You don't have to see this anymore and get this on my side screen here. So what's cool is that console, uh, Unite UA audio interfaces come with this thing called console, right? And this is basically a mixer that goes before your digital audio workstation. And you could see that in channel one, I've got this, this is where my audio is coming out. And then I can do some inserts here. So I've got this, you know, like this kind of a virtual preamp from UA, which I like the way it sounds. I've got a little Pooltech EQ and just bumping up that low end to give me the radio voice, man. And then uh, just to keep things a little bit from going, like if I talk loud or something goes on loud, you could see this is a compressor. It just drops down a little bit. It's not really affecting my, my voice that much, but if I got close to the mic, you'd see that this meter is moving here and just keeping the levels down a little bit. And what it has, though, is it has mute here. So if I want to take my mouth, I can mute it by clicking here, but that's cumbersome, right? So what I did was I did some research and I found that there's this little utility app that's free. So this is a, a little utility that runs in the background. Here we go. Great. And this does MIDI mapping for this Apollo software, right? And if you notice here, Apollo X4, that's the name of my, it recognizes this channel one, analog one. That's this here. And I've got it set up so that MIDI CC from the Nano Key Studio will mute it, right? So that's pretty cool. So I'm going to push that button, and you'll see right here, this will turn white. And then back to having my mic on. So I can run the whole show <laughs> um, just pushing some buttons. And I think I'm getting better video quality right now, which is the main for my screen. So, so that you guys can, when you're watching Zoom, it might not be so great. But if you do watch the, um, if you do watch the review video afterwards, you will see that it, it should look better. You know, um, I'm, at least I'm, that's my hope. So, but anyway, as it is now, I have three cameras, which is really will be helpful in the future. And I can also mute and unmute so that if I want to drink my tea. I can slurp without bothering you in your headphones. <laughs> All right, so fun with MIDI. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I actually just made a finish making a quick video about that that I'm going to post as soon as I finish editing it over the weekend. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say, so a couple of you emailed me and let me know that you were going to hand in your assignment late, which is perfectly fine. Unexcused late assignments, not fine. Excused late assignments, fine. The time for me to have looked at your assignment 
for last week and that ended. You know, I've got just, you know, I have to fit my teaching. I'm only an adjunct. So my hours are not like full-time professor where, you know, every day is like my teaching is my main thing. I have time every week slotted for my teaching activities. I've got time on Thursday to teach this class. I've got time on Wednesday to teach film scoring. And then I've got time usually, you know, within the day or two to go over assignments. So I'll go over your assignment, you know, in this next time that I've got slotted for going over Audio MIDI 2 assignments. So just let you know that. And uh, let's see, was there anything else? No, I think that's pretty much it. So before I continue on, any questions on programming structure free? It should be fairly, fairly easy. I don't think it's it's very difficult. So the first thing I want to play for you is uh, I don't have the session for this. I don't know where it went, which is very upsetting to me. But um, I went out. I think it was like in the spring of twenty, early spring of twenty nineteen, and I took my phone with me. And on my phone, I have a, sh a little microphone that Shure makes that plugs into the lightning port. And it does what's called mid-side stereo recording. And I go out with my dog for a walk every morning. And we're out for between one and two hours, right? We go out up where I live up here in the Hudson Valley. I can walk for 20, 15 or 20 minutes, be outside of the village and be walking in the middle of like beautiful nature. And it's one of the reasons why I live here and I don't live in the city anymore. Uh, because I was just, I'm just too old for being in the city. Uh, I'm not, but just, I just want, we just wanted this. We didn't want to be living in an apartment anymore. And, but what was really cool was that it was, there was some snow on the ground still, and there was melting ice, and there was little streams that I go by, there's birds, there's all sorts of stuff. So I took the phone with me, and I would capture a bunch of sounds, just like I'm asking you to do for this next assignment and I would bring them home and I'd get them into the computer and I had the fortune that I could make them into instead of mp3s full fidelity audio files and I would say that they had like a b plus sound quality to them the phone by itself is a c plus uh, the newer phones sound better so it might be a b but there's a little bit of extra noise on these no matter what your phone is but it's it's very helpful but with the microphone, it's better and it's in stereo. So I captured a bunch of sounds, got them in the computer, and I decided that I would work on them and process them. Sort of, I showed you a little bit of that last week. And then instead of programming them in the sampler, I placed them on the timeline in a way that I, this sort of like music concrete, you know, something that Varez or Stockhausen would do, uh, Euro European composers, although Varez lived down in Greenwich Village, uh, but just, you know, t f like found music that you put on tape and these guys would make tape loops and they'd cut things up and put reassemble them and everything. So I've got something that I'm going to play for you and I'm going to mute my microphone, take advantage of that and play this and it's called Music is Everywhere and then I'll just briefly show you a, a, a few things with it, but take a listen.
Okay, thank you. So let's look at some of the, I'm not gonna be able to solo these out like I can with Pro Tools, and sorry about that long black at the beginning. But um, this up here is, this first sound is water that I, I that water from like a, like melting snow that was on like a little, not even a brook, but like a tiny little flow of water. It was almost like just a little pond almost that things were, were sort of melting into. Right, and then I played around with the sound a little bit, and then a lot of reverb on that. And then this blue thing here is we've got like a tiny little greenhouse in the basement that sort of sticks out the side of the house, and snow was hitting the roof one morning, and I recorded that. Then you could see that, whoops, yeah, this video is really whack. These are stereo, the blue one and the top one. These are in mono. So now that I'm, as I'm looking at them, right, I actually think that the one, the, this one here, I took in Big Sur, California, uh, in six years ago. So if I go here to my Dropbox and I go for Chimey, that's the audio taken off of this video. I took this with my phone, like an iPhone 5 or 4 or something. This is a place called Nepente, and that's the Pacific Ocean down there. Right, so just, you know, capturing audio wherever you can. I captured that probably several years before I did this little experiment here. And there's all sorts of other stuff. You know, there's bird in a tree, I see, and then... Um, slow motion waves, probably at the ocean, slow motion geese, right? So there's just all sorts of stuff that I've got in here. And you sort of, I, some of it is treated where I've done some sound design to it. And some of it is as it is with just maybe some reverb on it. And I took all these sounds and I sort of assembled them in a way that sort of unfolded in a narrative that I thought was made sense to me. So you know, music's not always about the notes that you write or play, but how you assemble sounds. And you can extrapolate that out into your sound creation, right? Things aren't always pianos, saxophones, trumpets, drums, violins, electric guitars, acoustic guitars, flutes, panpipes. They're not always instruments with sampling the whole, any sound you hear can become an instrument that you can program and play, right? It's, it's really cool. Or you can use it to assemble in a way like this uh, to create a, a narrative that has nothing to do with anything you play on the key, on an instrument, right? So that's pretty, that's, so that's where I'm going with that. That's the first thing I wanted to talk about today. So the next bit is... This is a little track that I put together. You know, this probably took me like an hour to do using some of the material that you guys have today for today's class and then augmenting that with some sounds in uh, Expand 2. And this is going to be sort of the with the, the basis for your next assignment, except that you're going to be creating your own sounds. You're not going to be using the sounds that I've provided to you because I want you to get used to recording things. So I'll play it and then I'll do a breakdown of it. So what do I got here? Well, in the very top track, which is this blue track, and let me zoom in on that, I've got hi-hats from Boom, 
right? I just loaded boom in. I picked the kind of hi-hat that I wanted. And then I played it in on the keyboard. And then on top, underneath that, giving us our re regular drum set is the, I don't want to say it and get my video blocked, but it's the F drummer. So I cut it up into slices, right? And I'm playing it in, that's this track here. And then that goes with the boom hats. It's like this Mano de Bingo song called Sol Macosa. And then actually this green track should really be up here because this is those red rocks, which some of you picked. And the red rocks were literally, I still have them. They're red rocks that I picked up uh, from a national, from a park I, I visited in the desert of Arizona one day, uh, the same trip that I made that recording at uh, in Big Sur on the way home from that. We did a, a crazy seven-week uh, cross-country and back road trip one summer. It was amazing. I want to do it again next summer if things are a little better than they are now. So... Right, so that's those rocks, and then they come, they're sort of like clave, almost like a clave or a cowbell. See how they work in concert with the hi-hat? And then I have my Woodstock chimes. They come in over here, the pink track. And then the bass melodica, or melodion. So except for the boom hats, I made all those sounds. And then with the rest of that, there is a Rhodes. And that's just from Expand 2. It's the suitcase. And the bass is probably like fingered something. Yeah, full finger bass. Now, let's take a look at, uh, there's a couple of other things I want to show you. The red rocks, if you notice in this column here, I have, in the top slot it says delay, and in the bottom slot, slot it says reverb. So this is our said column, and we're sending a copy of the audio. And I believe we went over this a little bit last semester. We're going to go over it in much more detail this semester, because you're going to be doing this in every mix going forward. So I've got one that says delay. So I'm sending a copy of the audio from this track down to this pink track down here that says delay. And we'll go over how to do that. And I've got just our mod delay in there. And let me mute this here. And then let me add it back in. Right, let me turn up the amount of this. So that was between zero and five. Let me turn it way up. Right, so I'm not sure if you guys can hear it in stereo. I do have the original sound on and it's supposed to be broadcasting in stereo. But what's happening is that I've got the red rocks panned in the middle and then I've got echoes one to the left and one to the right. And the one to the left is an eighth note later, a dotted eighth note later, and the one to the right is a quarter note later. So you're getting a cross rhythm. You're getting the original sound, then you're getting almost like canonically it coming in a dotted eighth note later. And again, a second canonic voice coming in a quarter note later. So the same pattern happening on three separate timelines simultaneously. And then one, one is panned in the middle, one is panned in the left, and one is panned to the right. So that adds a lot of rhythmic vitality to a very static part. And that's a big, big part of things I do. And I think I've mentioned this before, is that that gives you kind of almost like a systems music, Stephen Reich 
kind of a th- you can use it to create things like that very efficiently and we'll, we'll get into that going forward as well but this is sort of just still intro and then below that in this this track over here I've got this clavinet bit happening which is this bit here Right, you can hear this delay on that. Really adds a lot of nice character to it. It's very, very Billy Preston. So now, yeah, okay. So I'm going to open up both of these and show you what I've done with the sound. So this instance, and I don't really recommend I don't often do this I do it occasionally I have the echo plugged right into the uh, inserted into the track so let me mute the this and this and the reverb and play right so that's the clavinet sound it's really sterile so I inserted and you guys should all have this something called sans amp in, in there and this is a, this sans amp was one of the first and I actually owned the pedal well it wasn't a pedal it was a rack mounted unit that this is modeled after and I sold it and I really wish I didn't sell it but this is made by this company uh, Tech 21 uh, because they were originally based on 21st Street in the city and it was the f- sans amps were the first pedal kinds of things that s- tried to emulate guitar tube guitar amps and they were hugely successful in the 90s uh, for, for like hip hop people would put their voices through it, put every all sorts of st- instruments through them to distort and give them all sorts of character like they're putting it through a big amplifier. So the f- I wanted to add some character to this very clean and sterile sound, right? You can see it's nasty now. And I'll go over how to look at this, but if you want to play around with this, you go into, if you've got your stuff set up correctly and you go into Avid, it should be in your Avid folder. I've got more Avid stuff than you do, but Sans Amp is right there. Otherwise, you could find it in Harmonic, probably. Yeah, Sans Amp. So, um, that's a distort, like an amp, it's like a, a, a guitar amp. So, I've got that. And on the delay, I've got this set up a little bit differently than the Red Rocks delay. So on this one, on the left side, I have the dotted eighth note. And on the right side, I've got a dotted quarter note. So let's play that and listen to that. So, and if you notice right here, this is my mix on the left side and this is my mix on the right side. I've got it set to 22 and 24 percent so that it's only 22 percent of the wet echoed signal comes through. So it's basically 80 percent dry and 20 percent echo. So let me turn off this one here. So that's 24 percent. I'll turn this all the way off and then we'll hear the dotted eighth note echo. Right, and then let's bring this one up. And let's turn this one down. This is the dotted quarter note. So you can see it it, it, it waits till it comes in, right? It's just much, you know, you hear the line and then you hear the, the echo coming in. Now, the other thing to notice about this is that this feedback, I did go over this, but I'll review it. Feedback is the number of echoes, the number of repeats. It, it, it means something different than that, but that's the easiest way to remember it. So, in other words, if this is your sound, and then I'll hit it once, and then I'll repeat it manually, All those extra ones, that's the number of feedbacks. The higher the percentage 
the more number of echoes there are. So let me demonstrate. So this is set for 30 now. Let me bring it up to like 82. Right? Bring it back down to 30. Right, it's got two that you can hear and then a few more that are less, that are softer. When the feedback was up high, you had more of them were louder and it took longer for them to start to decay. So with it's very important because you can really make your mixes muddy, your sound muddy with too much feedback. Uh, you can use it to great effect, but start out with a tasty amount. But you notice that with this one here, that's a, a dotted quarter note, the, um, oh, I'm sorry, I made a boo-boo. Let's do that one more time. Uh, technology, gotta love it. Okay, let's turn this back up to 80. I was wondering why it was coming out of my right ear. Right, there you go. So that's the feedback going way up. On So the one that's shorter, a dotted eighth note, it's a shorter time value than a dotted quarter note. I have more feedback than on the one that's coming in after with the dotted quarter note. Let's turn this back up. So let me make them a little bit wetter, more than is appropriate for the music, but just so that you can hear the the, the cross rhythms a little bit more. So I'll make them 50-50. All right. So that's how that's treated, and then there's that also is being sent to the reverb. You can see that in addition to the echo, it's in a nice room now. So let's listen to, the, let's listen to everything together. Here we go. All right, so there you have it. That's a little piece that will be part of your assignment for your, for your next assignment will be something like this, where you're going to create four structure instruments yourself by recording things yourself. And you may do, I'm going to write this out and post it up, and it's going to be due in, uh, I, at least in two weeks, possibly three weeks. I just have to just go through that and see which one it is. But I'll, I'll have something posted up officially tomorrow. But I did ask you to start thinking about recording stuff for this week, which you don't have to hand in, but just to get, get that going. And the other thing, too, I wanted to say is that um, gather more materials than you might need, right? Record more sounds than you might think that you need. Because if you've only recorded four sounds, what if they don't really work in your composition? Then you're kind of stuck, right? So it's always good to have a little bit extra headroom. Okay, so that's this. Now there's one other technique I want to um, show you. I have to reboot Pro Tools because it's at a different sample rate. Actually, let's go right in here. 
And this would be um, acceptable for one of your sounds to do something like this, but I want to show you this anyway. And let's do this. So, um, okay, so this is a view of my studio, and you could see over here, I've got a Give me one second here. The one thing about this Apollo is that it doesn't like to change sample rates really well. I might, this, so I have to boot that up again. All right, so you notice over here, I've got a bunch of synthesizers, right? Uh, this is a Prophet 6. This is a Moog Subsequent 37. This is a Moog uh, Matriarch, my favorite synth. ARP 2600, Mini Moog up there. And I've got others on this side and down in the basement. Um, I got a lot of... Uh, I, I have a lot of, a lot of instruments. And, oh, great, it opened properly. Excellent. So what if you want to, you have a friend who has a really cool synth or an instrument, like a really cool synth that you want to record, you, you'd love to have. And so you, you go visit that friend, you bring your little recording setup with you, your Pro Tools session, and you record them, you record their instrument. Do some, maybe it's got presets that you like or you learn how to program a synth a little bit. Well, what you want to have is a way to do it efficiently and quickly. And for me, what I like to do for this one specific use case scenario is to set up a performance template that I just push a button and it goes, right? So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to show you how to do this with a virtual instrument, a built-in virtual instrument uh, like Expand. Okay, so let's go to the videotape here. So I think it was last semester, or maybe it was last year. I can't remember, but I went over how to do some sound designing in Expand to create interesting sounds. So in other words, for those of you that are new here, and there are a few of you. Expand is the rompler, meaning that it has sampled sounds and it plays them back, that comes with Pro Tools. And when they first released it 15 years ago, it was really great. It was ahead of its time. It was really great. But they haven't upgraded it in 15 years. And what they do now, and this is one thing, reason why I do not like Avid, the company, even though I love Pro Tools, the software, is they let you license this... Um, thing called the Falcon, I believe, by this company called UVI, which is really great. But when you're, if your Pro Tools, uh, license, if you let your subscription lapse, it stops working. This, if you let your subscription lapse, you'll still have a license to use Pro Tools. You just won't get any updates um, if you've purchased Pro Tools, which I have. If you're just, if you're just uh, doing a subscription, then you're going to be in trouble. I, I'm, I'm not sure how that quite works with Pro Tools, which is one reason why I say when you get out of the class, explore other sequencers. They might be a little bit more up your alley, even though I feel like it's good to teach in Pro Tools. So what I've done here is I've created a sound in, a, a, f a bunch of sounds in Expand that I think sound really good. So this is, this is something I've called a deep pad. And if I were to just play it for you. Right, and it's basically, I've layered four instruments. I've layered this thing called cella pad, which is probably like a celeste pad. And then I've layered uh, this thing called undercurrent, which is a polysynth, basic square pad and soft piano. And then I've played around with the parameters for each one of those four parts and balance the levels you could see here and done some panning which you could see here and here 
so that this, this pad is on the left, so I could turn these off and we could dissect this a little bit better. So, right, that's this sound here. Cut off is really down. And that's panned to the left. And then if I turn this one on, this is undercurrent. This is in the middle, panned in the middle. And let's see what's up here with this. Yeah. Brought the cutoff way down, slowed the attack. Then this is the basic square pad. This is also in the middle. Oh no, this is panned a little to the right. Just slowed the attack down, added some release. And that blends nicely with this top one. One's on the left and the other's on the right. It's a nice wide stereo field. And then the bottom one is this electric piano. And what's nice about that, I'm not sure you, if, if you have headphones on, you, that's panning back and forth. And that has a control for that tremolo rate and tremolo depth. So that's kind of cool. And if we turn everything back on, Okay, so I want to, I like that, right? Let's imagine that I've got a bunch of synthesi synthesizers when I program that sound. I want to record that into Pro Tools and then to edit it. So what I've done here is for, for, for this purpose, you don't have to record every note. You don't have to record every note, right? You can record in minor thirds, it's it's more than sufficient. With real acoustic instruments, I like to record almost every note, unless I'm just doing a, a quick down and dirty character instrument where I don't need to. But for really deep, detailed sampling, you want to record every note. You want to record multiple dynamics, and you want to record multiple hits of the same notes so that you can set up what's called round robins. That works better in uh, contact, but with structure-free and what we're doing here, with a synth sound like this, two notes per octave is fine. Uh, three notes, per, four notes per octave is better, but I'm trying to just do something that would save some time. So what I did here was I created a little performance and notice that all the velocities are the same on this. Let me just see down here. All the velocities are the same, and the length of every note is the same. And basically what I've sampled is C and F sharp up every octave from C0 all the way up to C5. So basically two notes per octave, C and F sharp. So I did a symmetrical subdivision of the octave. I cut it right in half, right at its midpoint, right? Everybody knows that uh, from C to F sharp is the same distance as from F sharp up to C. Two, tr you know, one's a tritone from C to F sharp, and the next one is a tritone from F sharp to C. So we've divided the octave uh, symmetrically, and that's something that like 20th century composers that did 12-tone techniques were really uh, interested in, just as a tangential side note. But for our purposes, that's nice. It gives us you know, an even set of um, notes per each octave. So I basically have this here, and I highlight that, and then I right click and I'll just do something called commit and I'll do nothing with the source track and it'll render it right and then I'm gonna want to rename this because it comes up with this commit so I'll just I double clicked on that and I delete and then I delete this space and I'll put an underscore in there right and then basically what you can do is, <clears throat> because we did this on the beat, give me one sec. Uh, so love having the mute button. I can just cut these all off like this, right? Very, very, this is fine. And if I was doing this in contact, I would do this a little bit differently. I would leave a little space before every note because and adjust everything in, in contact. But 
structure free doesn't have that. So I would go through that and then I would, um, whoops. Right, okay, so I can, I'm hiding that one and I'm gonna make this one active. And then basically, I would name all these, right? So I already did this. And if you could see, I've named these deep pad underscore C zero, deep pad underscore F sharp zero, same thing C one, F sharp one, and all the way up till we get to C five. And then select all those and then um, command shift K to get export selected, go to choose. And then what I did was I went into this, you know, the session that I made this template for, I created virtual instrument sample folder, a deep pad folder, right? And then I exported all those. And then I loaded those into structure and named it deep pad. We went over how to do that. And I just changed the amp envelope and the velocity sensitivity to make it better. And so this is the original. And this is, whoops, this is the deep pad and structure. Really close. Now, it's going to sound a little different because I only um, sampled at one velocity level. So if I play this hard, if I play it soft, it's got a different timbre to it. So whatever the velocity, this is, um, if I try to match that here, you can see it's very close. And I created a really nice instrument there. And what's really great about doing this is that if someday you do decide to buy Contact or you work in Logic or um, Cubase or something, if you learn a good filing system, you'll have all your samples and you can program it into those, the samplers that come with those uh, with, with those DAWs, especially Logic, the ESX is a very good sampler. Uh, it's much more f high featured than the structure free. Uh, although, the, like I said last week, the full version of structure is very good. They should actually give that to you. But Avid is cheap. So, um, you know, they're, they're more about profits than making their user base happy. All right. So you can, for the, for the following assignment, you can use can I have to ask a question uh, before you do that? Yep. Yeah. This is Paul. Uh, yeah. If you would have used less of those samples, like let's say C sharp, uh, what was it? C to F sharp. If I just used, right. Zero. So if I had just used C, C, uh, octaves, just every to... C, every, every, every octave, right? Well, because what I noticed when I tried, it was hard in structure to tell a, a qualitative difference as opposed to adding more samples. I mean, I mean, is that true just in structure or am I missing something? No, um, the, the more notes you get. So, so what you have to realize, Paul, is that on instruments, different registers have different characters. And you want to capture those characters. And you can't do that if you're just doing octaves. With synthesizer sounds, it's it's easier to get away from it with it than very detailed, harmonically rich acoustic instruments, right? So I used a bottle, right? I blew into a bottle, and then I added a little water, and right. so I, I did like F sharp and G, and then I ran it up the keyboard. I could, if I would have added more, I don't know if I would have in uh, structure. Well, 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 we'll put it this way. The other thing too is that when it doesn't matter if it's structure or contact, but the 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 the, the basic gist is that if you're going to stretch a sample higher, 
So let's say your last note is the C above middle C and you play an octave above that. That's not going to sound as good as if you take that C above middle C and play the octave below that with the same sample. Pitch stretching samples down always sounds better than pitch stretching them up. That's I, I don't know the reason for that, but that's definitely a fact. Um, I did notice that. Yeah. So, uh, and, and once you get into contact, it has these time stretching algorithms that Structure Free doesn't have. And it, it, it sort of can mask some of that, but they still sound better being pitched down. So when you're doing something like a, a bottle, like, like Paul, if you took your acoustic, your beautiful acoustic guitar, and you just sampled the A, an A440, and you tried to play like acoustic guitar parts on that, it wouldn't sound very good. But if you sampled the entire acoustic guitar or like every third, minor thirds all the way up, right, you, you'd get more of the register changes captured that your guitar has because the higher notes on your guitar vibrate differently because of how you're chopping the string in half rather than the low notes. And open notes sound different than fretted notes, right? So you can't capture that uh, without actually recording those notes. All right. Okay, thanks. That's actually very helpful. Yeah, no worries. So, you know, you got to get started doing this stuff and you start out just by capturing easy things and learning the techniques to make instruments. Once you have the foundations down, then you can get into more in-depth uh, sampling. And that's not really the focus of this class because if we were in regular school, we have contact in all of the uh, computers in the lab, right? Uh, we would be able to let you program in contact. We, I could get into more deep, like, you know, multi-sampling, a different layer, different dynamic levels, doing round robins and all that stuff. But because we're using structure free, not happening. So, but what we are learning, which is very valid, is the whole technique. Because to make an instrument in contact, as I showed you last week, it's a little bit more detailed involved, but it's the same process. You got to name the notes the same way. You got to drag them in. You got to, you know, you can, there is a very easy way to manually stretch the notes so that they fill up all the spaces, uh, to automatically stretch the notes so that they fill up all the spaces. I showed you how to manually do it, but you know, it's, it's very, but all the techniques that we're learning now, you can transfer into any other sampler that you're using. Okay, so that's one thing that I wanted to go through. All right, so we talked about this a little bit last week. Oh, please don't crash on me. It's the spinning ball. All right, let me, uh, oh, great. All right, so that same summer that I was out in California, I was in Berkeley, California. Spent a month there. It's very interesting. Um, and again, I used my phone. This is a stereo recording, and I captured these wind chimes that somebody had at their house. No, actually, these were the wind chimes at the house I was staying at. Right. And I, I remember a little bit more clearly. So what you can do with this is what I've done here. I, I've recorded a bunch of stuff and I've chopped things out that I found interesting. Right, well, we did that with the Woodstock chimes, right? So let's go right up. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go right up to this area here. So I put my, play, my playback head there. I hit tab, and that gets me right to that uh, transient. I hit that, and I delete, right? And then I'm going to do a little fade fade out so I'm going to use the selector tool <clears throat> click and drag right and as long as you've got your A and Z turned on if you hit the letter F 
on your keyboard, it puts a little fade out in. So that's kind of cool. So what I want to do, I want to teach you guys some destruct. Everything I've taught you about sound designing things has been inserts, and that's non-destructive. That will that will keep your sample, your sound intact, and you'll just hear the processed sound coming out of the the outputs, but it won't actually change the sound that's being fed into all those different plugins. I'm going to show you now how to do some destructive editing. So I'm going to copy that. Right, Command C, and I'm going to paste it right here so that I've got it duplicate. Whoops, I've got it duplicated, and then I'm going to right. Okay, so there's a column right here called Audio Suite, and these are all the same plugins you have, except that they do destructive at, uh, processing on the sound. In other words, they change the sound and create a new sound based upon how you're playing around with things. So what I'm going to do with this is I want to create something that I can play on the keyboard that is a an atmosphere more than something that's musical that you would play like an instrument. So I'm going to go to Avid and I'm going to go to Pitch 2. You won't have all these in yours, but you'll have Pitch 2. And pitch two is something that we can use to pitch this way down. And it's stereo. And we can pitch one side of our, the left side one way and the right side another way. So the first thing you have to do is when this is up, you have to click and make sure that the audio file that you want to process is highlighted. And then down here, there's a little speaker. If I zoom in on that right here, if I hit click on this, it will play back the sample. And that's how you can audition what you're going to do. So let's take a look at these controls here. So this is a keyboard up here, right? And it's left and right. So right here, it says pitch shift left, link, and pitch shift right. If you've got this linked, whatever you do to the left will be mirrored in the right. So if I take this, which is my course control, that'll do things in half steps, and I click and drag it to the left, you'll see that both keyboards are doing the same thing. Now, we don't really need to worry about the pitch, what the actual pitch is. I can just say I'm going to transpose the whole thing down 12 semitones, minus 12 semitones. That's one octave. And then if I play the speaker, we're going to be able to hear it. So that's interesting because that automatically now, to my ears, goes from being those nice wind chimes to being like Javanese gamelan music, Balinese gamelan music. Right? So let's look at this, these down here. So delay. Let's see what happens when I turn the delay up. So I've turned it up to 289 milliseconds, so a little bit more than a quarter of a second. Let's do it a little bit more. Oh, I see. So what that does if, is it fades the sound in, I think. Yeah, so it doesn't capture the first bit, right? So let's leave that here. Now the mix, let's play around with that. So it's full mix. Let's turn the mix down 50%. So what we should hear with this is 50% of the original sound and 50% of the sound that's an octave lower. Interesting, right? And that's the original sound. So it's interesting, we're adding up. And it will loop, it'll keep playing it. And then if you want to hear the original, click Bypass. Now let's, let's see what happens 
So I kind of like that so far. Like we've got the original sound and then this other sound. Let's balance that a little better. So let's see what happens when we turn the feedback up. You see how it's much busier now? So it's giving us some sort of delay. Right, no feedback. Much busier. That could be kind of an interesting. Now, low pass filter, we know what low pass filters do. We can attenuate some of those high frequencies. Let's bypass. And there's our original sound. And look at that. That is interesting. Now, let me show you something else. If I turn the link off, I leave everything the same, I'm going to bring this down another 12 to 24. Oh, wait, they both did it. Oh, I didn't turn the link off. Let me try that one more time. Okay, turn the link off. And then I can bring this one down 12 more to 24. And that's really interesting because in my headphones, I can hear right in the middle the original. In the left ear, I can hear the one that's an octave lower, and in the right ear, I can hear the one that's two octaves lower. Not sure I like that. Let me see if I play around with the low pass filter. No, that's not going to do what I want. I'm not sure I like that. So. So what if I do the same kind of concept as before and I split this down so that it's an octave and a half? That's interesting. And maybe this one will come in a little bit later. So let's start it again. Yeah, so I'm not, whoops, excuse me. I'm not crazy about that. And what's interesting too is that you can link just this guy here. Right, you can separately link them. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm not sure I like this. I'm gonna go back to the octave, each one doing the same thing. Because it just gets too confusing. And turn the mix up a little bit on these. And let me turn down this low pass filter. I want to make it murky, you know. So it's seeming like the original one is not getting low pass filtered, just the affected one. Great. And then once you get something that you like, you hit this thing called render over here. And then, oh wait, I'm blocking that. You can't see it. Over here, there's something called render. Click that. Well, first you should stop it. And then click render. Boom. And then now. So this is wind chimes, Berkeley. So let me, let me clean this up. I'm just right, Burke pitch. So let's think about this for a second. So I want this to be really murky. So what I want to do is I'm going to go to my EQ now and uh, I'll go to Avid and then I'm going to use my EQ 17 band. I want to get rid of some of those high frequencies. So I'm going to turn this up 
here, right? Let me zoom in so you can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to select my low pass filter and I'm going to do a gentle slope. So I'm going to get down to 6 dB and I'm going to listen. Liking that, I'm going to render that. And if you wanted to be safe and keep all your steps, like a diary, you could copy that and, you know, uh, you could just duplicate that and you could affect this, this one here. So let me add that EQ in again. We're about there, and we did this, and we did this. Great, and then, so you could keep sort of a diary, right? EQ, or LPF, low pass filter. Okay, so what if I wanna make this even, do something else to this completely? So let's go here and let's go to Avid and let's go to Dverb, right? And I want to make this really, really spacious with reverb. And I want that to be part of the, um, part of the sound. Well, the first thing you have to realize is that I've got this much time selected. And if I've got reverb, the reverb is going to continue on after the sound ends and you don't want your sound to be cut off. So what I would suggest you do if you use this method is to hold the shift key down and then clicks way past here so that this entire area is selected. It will process out where it's selected. So let's take a listen to this and we want to have our mix be, bring our mix down. Interesting, right? What happens is interesting here. They've got this thing called reverse. Let me let me try that. Wow, listen to that. Interesting. So if you're going to do reverse, you don't need to have all of this selected, right? So I'm going to undo that. I'm going to render it the normal way. And I'm going to listen to this. And let me make the waveform. All right, let me do this. Whoops. Uh, Command E, separate that out, delete. Let me do a little fade out. And let me copy. Command C and paste. Command V. And with this one here, I'm going to do the reverse. Really cool, interesting sound. So what I can do with this is I need to I need to give it a pitch, right? It doesn't matter what. Well, actually, let me see if there if it if, if it's tonally somewhere. Uh, so let me add a, let me add a stereo uh, mini grand. All right, so that's some sort of C tonality. That was a lucky guess. So I'm just going to, um, and I'll just put this at like, let's say, so I want to, 
think about it, right? I've got one sample I'm going to load into structure. I want to be able to pitch that down. So I want to put that somewhere in the middle of the keyboard so that I've got a lot of low notes that I can add to make it even murkier. So let's say I call this C4. And then let's uh, Command Shift K. Let me choose. Right, new folder. Uh, this is sound design. Samples. And in here, it's uh, reverse Burke chime. Open and then export. Great. And then obviously I can Command Shift N, one new. Oh, actually, let me get rid of this mini grand. I don't need to add a new. So, uh, music structure free. Get rid of this. In contact, you don't have to remove the patch. All right. It just comes empty. And just drag this in. And it automatically does it because it's only one sample, right? And it names it for you. So you can just get rid of that. And then let's play this. So it needs to add a little volume. And we need to add a little bit of an amp on the envelope. Some release. That's like a whole film cue <laughs> with just like a couple of notes being played, right? Seriously. Maybe a little bit more release. goes on. I'm not holding it down anymore. So with a little ingenuity, right, you can do quite a bit. So what I want you to do, and like I said, I'm going to, I'll write up something. I wanted to see how far we got today. We got through, uh, we're going to do more. There's more stuff for today's lesson, but we're moving into a different category next. If you've recorded sounds, you take your phone. If you've got a microphone and an audio interface, I haven't showed you how to set that up yet unless you've taken Recording Studio Fundamentals. We went over that. Uh, you can get stuff out of your house. You can go sound on a sound safari. <laughs> That's what I call it, what I do when I go out with uh, a recording device. I either bring the microphone for my phone or I've got something, a Zoom stereo recorder. Uh, I go on a sound safari and I capture sounds, right? Um, if you go outside, you got to be careful of wind, right? Wind can ruin your sound. So you got to try to be in a spot where there's not a lot of wind. I've got on my microphone here, I've got like a little foam screen on there and it's still... If I'm too close, I can pop my... You see that? Ugh, that's horrible. I, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't hurt anybody's ears just then. But just be careful of wind and listen back. See, like, if, if you hear, see, hear a sound that you like in the distance, you know, listen, record it, listen to it. Maybe you might need to get closer. Maybe you might need to get a little further away. But learn how to develop some critical listening skills. What are you listening for? What, what are interesting sounds, right? I showed you that there were geese, water uh on a, melting water on an ice i've got one sound i recorded i i was uh on one of my morning walks right off the path which was t totally trans you know no snow or ice on it 
there was a, a little pond that was filled with uh, runoff water from snow melting, and it had frozen. Now, you couldn't walk on it. It wasn't that kind of frozen. You couldn't ice skate on it. But what I did was I took a handful of gravel from the path that I was walking on, and I threw it into the um, onto the ice, and I captured the sound, and it was really cool. I didn't think of that. I saw somebody doing that on YouTube, and I sort of emulated that, and it was really cool. And I've used that to create my own sampler, sound design-y kind of a thing. I've showed you uh, things that I captured in my old apartment in the hallway. Had a lot of reverb, like some slams, some door hits, some hitting the fire extinguisher. Also, there's all sorts of things that can make sounds. You need some sustainy sounds. You need some percussive sounds, some sounds that actually have a pitch to them. So, you know, just start recording stuff, get it into the computer and start editing it. And if, if you want to, for some of them, start sound designing it. Experiment around. See what these things do. If you don't like it, if you're doing the destructive version, always copy it and work on the copy. And if you don't like it, Command Z, undo. And as long as you're working on a copy, you'll always have your original one. And what I like to do is I like to make a diary, much like saving different versions. I have my original sound. I have my first sound design when I'm doing the destructive audio suite. Copy and paste that further on the line. Add a next level of sound design. And I only did two levels of sound design here, or three levels. I did pitch, low pass filter, and reverb, right? Yeah, so just you got to play around with things and start to develop your ear and a taste and what sounds good. And I want you to struggle and, you know, flail a little bit. Um, I'm sure you'll come up with usable sounds, though. I'm, I'm almost positive of that. Every, stu every, every class, the students come up with stuff that surprises me how good it is. So get started. This, like I said, the final project is going to be that you're going to write a piece of music using four of your own structure instruments and a handful of um, soft uh, synths like Expand, Boom. I have to figure out, I have to look at the roster and, you know, the undergraduates have a certain amount. Undergraduates that are music majors have a certain amount of tracks and graduate students will have a different amount of of uh, additional tracks, but you all have to make four sampler instruments. So get started on that and try to be done programming your sampler instruments by next week. You don't, you, you know, if, if you want me to give you feedback on that, I certainly will. Uh, and you can hand in that and I can listen to the sounds and give you feedback. But if you just want to, you know, you, that the final project's going to be due either in two or three weeks. And I'll make that decision uh, tomorrow morning when I get up. I think it's pro probably going to be three weeks, but it might be two weeks. All right. Any questions on this? Talkative bunch today, aren't we? <laughs>
right? So there's a graph involved, and that shape of the graph is the waveform of that signal. In electronics, the term is usually applied to periodically varying voltages, currents, or electromagnetic fields. So that has to all do, so periodically meaning that over a certain amount of time, a period of time, the electricity or something to do with electrics, electro, electric, electricity, voltage, current, or electromagnetism, that v varies over a certain amount of time and, and then it returns and repeats the same wave. But in acoustics, it's usually applied to steady periodic, so the word period, and I'll show you that in a minute, sounds, variations in pressure of pressure in air or other media. In these cases, the waveform is an attribute that is independent of the frequency, amplitude, or phase shift of the signal. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that, but we'll talk about that in a second. The waveform of a steady periodic sound affects its timbre. Synthesizers and modern keyboards can generate sounds with many complicated waveforms. So we're going to talk today about the first thing we're going to talk about are three sounds. I'm, I'm missing one. It's okay. I'm, I'm not too... Uh, it's the concepts I want you to get used to. So the first one is called a sine wave. And a sine wave is very important because it can be said that every sound you hear is made up of different combinations of sound, of sine waves occurring simultaneously at different amplitudes and at different pitches. Right? So diff, like you can have... 15 Stein waves of different pitches stacked on top of each other to create a sound, and each pitch is unique to the fundamental pitch, which is the sound you hear the most of, and each one of those has a varying vo volume, amplitude. And if you change the volume of one of those overtones, you will change the timbre of the sound. If you change the pitch of one of those overtones or those other sine waves, you will also change the timbre of that sound. Now, I'm fairly certain that last semester I showed you guys how to do that on the Hammond organ. Uh, I'm fairly certain I did that. So let's get back to the sine wave. The sine wave is defined as a curve representing periodic oscillations of constant amplitude as given by a sine function. So that's math. And the thing to remember there is a constant volume as given by, right, periodic oscillations of a constant amplitude. A sine wave is the simplest of all waveforms and contains only single fundamental frequencies and no harmonics or overtones. Really hard to find a pure sine wave in any synthesizer. They all have more than just the fundamental, but this is the goal. So the next bit is all sounds in nature are fundamentally constructed of sine waves. More complex sounds contain more oscillations at different frequencies. So the more complex a sound, the more frequencies of sine waves you have. So a simple sound might just have the one sine wave with one or two additional sine waves above it. More complex sounds might have 20, 30, 40, or 50 different pitches of sine waves above it, all at different volumes. Okay, And those other notes are known as harmonics, and some of them occur naturally in physics, and some of them are a little bit not what you would find naturally in physics, and we'll get to that in a second. That's what happens when like two instruments play, or you play a chord, right? All, each one of those individual notes of the chord has its own set of harmonics com comprised by, the, the, by physics, like the overtone series, but if you're playing C and E at the same time, the combination of those two is a little bit, it, it's not, it, it creates a little bit more complex sound because you've got those harmonics series happening at the same ratio for each note. And if each note has is a different um, instrument, right, they're all at different volumes. So in other words, if you have an oboe and a flute playing two different pitches a third apart, the oboe has a much more harmonically rich sound, so there's more overtones that you can hear present than a flute, which is more like a sign, more pure sound, with more f filled with fundamentals and octaves and stuff, and less with the fifths and thirds and all the other ones, all the other intervals. So the next 
in sound that I want to talk about wave is called a square wave. And a sine wave is only made up of the fundamental. The square wave contains harmonics, right? And they're doing the odd number multiples of the fundamental frequency. And that gives you this square shape. And a sawtooth wave oh, contains odd and even harmonics. Hmm. There we go. A sawtooth wave contains both odd and even harmonics. So it contains all of the harmonics and is richest in terms of timbre. It's got the most overtones. And you could see that it looks like this one looks more like a triangle wave, but a sawtooth would go, would ramp straight up. That's incorrect there. And I'll show you that in a second. So how does that work in real life, right? So right here, I've got this thing called the signal generator. And this is 440, which is the A above middle C. And that's a sine wave. And you could see that it looks just like, let me make this bigger so it's easier for everybody to see. The period, now, people measure the period differently. They measure from the one peak to the next peak, or they measure where it crosses the this axis here to this axis here. I, I'm not sure which one is correct and which one isn't, but you just really need to understand that or it could actually be from here to here, right? This is one cycle. That's one period. Remember I said the word period before? Of a sine wave. And it, it looks, it's a nice curve, right? And then the number of these periods that happen in a second is the f frequency. The frequency of these periods is the pitch, right? And then the distance from this crossing line here to the top, that's the volume. So if something's louder, you'll see that gets wide, a wider span there. All right, so that's the sine wave. This is a square wave. Now, this is not a pure square wave. You can see it's got a little funny stuff going on here. But you can hear that that sounds really buzzy. You can hear the you can hear the A and then you can hear like pitches above it. So in other words, with that that square wave, you can you can hear that inside of this and then other sounds above it. Right? L listen to what this sounds like and see if you can pick it out in the next sound. So I'll play it without talking this time. So you hear the sine wave in there, and then you hear something that's nasally sounding, right? So that you hear at least two pitches. You hear there's more pitches in there, but it's, you can very clearly hear two pitches in there, creating a composite timbre. And let's look at the sawtooth. And there we go. There's your sawtooth, not that other thing that was incorrect. Looks like a tooth of a saw. So I can hear about four pitches in there right now. I hear the original one, I hear what was in the square wave, and then I hear these other ones that are even more nasally. So an oboe sounds, has this kind of a setup, right? Flute has more of the sine wave kind of a thing. Other instruments have different combinations of those things. These are the three of this. There's also another one called triangle, which looks like a triangle. Um, it has less uh, volume on the harmonics than the square wave does. And it's a, a, a rounder sound. These sounds are typically found on analog synthesizers in what's called subtractive synthesis. That's, that's another complete lecture, which is not part of this course. I will, I have showed you guys that a little bit of that last semester. I may review that a little bit this semester. But my point being, what, what happens, what do we get to with acoustic instruments, right? 
All right. So right here, I've got rim shot of a drum. Right? So it's basically taking a drumstick and hitting the rim on a snare. So you, instead of holding the drum kit, the stick like this or, or like this, you, you hold it like this and you take the, the thicker end of it and you hit that against the rim of the snare drum, typically. So look at this waveform. Do you see how complex that is compared to the sine wave? So... Right, so this is, a, this is an oscilloscope. We don't really need to see that right now. But if we look here, you could see all these different frequencies contained in there. Whereas if I go back to the beginning and I play my sine wave, let's clear the memory. Right, you're only hearing that really that one pitch. If, if I go to our square wave, you're seeing, right? You see all these are, these are each one of these things is a pitch. And you can see they're very sharp and very defined. If we go to the sawtooth, right? You could see that it's interesting because these here, let me zoom in. See how wide that is? on some of those upper frequencies as opposed to the square wave. You see how they're really defined and sharp, and you do get a little bit of an extra ones up here, but that's much higher up. Right here, these are really sharp, so you can really see the difference in that. But if we mute this, and we go to our Well, this is louder sound, but you could see just how some of these higher harmonics are louder than the fundamental pitches. See that? Interesting. Let's take a listen to a snare drum. Now, this is important because we're going to talk about mixing this semester, right? And you have to understand some of these concepts here and how they kind of fit in and help you when you're mixing, so it's clear. So Andy, are you in a practice room at the college? I am, yeah, I've got a big band rehearsal tonight. Ah, cool. I just noticed you were wearing a mask, which I would be doing too if I was in the campus. So it's actually, uh, you have to, right? It's required. Yeah. Okay, so this is a snare drum. Now look at all this down here. Right? This has frequencies that go down to 8 hertz. You don't really hear that. And you see how it's flat. All these other ones are flat, so you get pretty high up. And then they kind of fade down. Here are some strings. That fade. Oh, let's not do the strings. So this is a brass line with a brass section. This is not sampled instruments. These are real players. Right, let's take a look at that. So that's many instruments playing. Look at how complex that waveform is, right? That's the pink one right here. So let's mute this and let's take a let's listen to the first trumpet. And let's get our frequency guy up here. Right, you see the trumpet's taking up all this information up here. This stuff down here is just the room sound being captured if there's like a you know a low rumble from air conditioning or anything like that. It's being excited by a trumpet. 
But let, this is something weird with trumpets that I want to show you, is that, let me zoom in on this. You see the crossing line, which is right here, there's more amplitude above than below. That's something to do with trumpets. I don't know why, but that's, if, I, if somebody would show me that, I would guess that that's a trumpet sound. And then this is the second trumpet. Right, and if I zoomed in on that, you notice, see how that's the same? Same kind of idea. And then alto sax, which is this guy here. Right, so this, this one here has more activity going up and below to below the middle of the, the middle line there. Barry Sachs. So let's do this. This is another, this is an oscilloscope here. This will show us the waveform. So if I play the baritone saxophone, that, it doesn't, I can't get this to hold, but this looks very similar to the, what you're seeing over here. Now let's see what happens when I add the, trump, the trumpet in, right? So I'm going to add the first trumpet back in. See, it's getting more complicated. You see those high, the high pitch, the volume things, right? Let's add the second trumpet in. Getting more complex. Let's add the alto sax. Right, and then the Barry sack, the tenor sax will add the trombone. Oh, I have to unmute those, hold on. So what I want to do now is get this here and so this gray one up here is the entire section. Let me do this. That should be muted so we don't hear it. Yes. And I'll just mute it here. Just double check. The combination of all the instruments playing together should look very similar to this. So let me let me zoom out a little bit. Oops. And let's do this. Not quite, but it's looking more like it than just the sole instrument. So you know, this is just like a little exercise for us to just see these kinds of things, combinations of instruments together and what they do and how they create complex waveforms. And it's because all of the overtones are intermingling together to create an ag a new aggregate sound. And when you're mixing, you have to understand this stuff, not like so much by frequencies like my friend Ken does, but you have to understand, like, you know, 400K or 4K or 400 hertz. or But, like, you need to be able to hear that there are other pitches happening and how they clash or complement the things that you're, uh, that you're mixing together. So you got to sort of start developing your ears with that. Give me one second. Okay. So this is a strings. Fading in, right? And let's make this really big. And as it the volume increases, 
right? So this is really soft. That's what the waveform kind of looks like there. And as you can see here, the volume increases. It's the same pitch. So the period, the distance from here to here, stays the same, right? For all these, because it's the same pitch. But as it gets louder, right, you see that the height changes, right? You can see that the height changes. So as it gets louder, the period, because the pitch is the same, the distance between the two peaks or the two troughs, that or, that, or the null area, that stays the same. The number of those per second stay the same. But because the volume gets louder, amplitude, the actual size of the wave grow, grows in this, in this kind of a fashion. And it is true that when you're playing an instrument louder, it changes the overtones on the same pitch. You're hearing different overtones as when you're playing soft. So that, that, that'll change the wave as well. Let's take a listen to this other strings here. So let's take a look here. So with this one here, this is really difficult to see, but if I were to go, I could do this actually this way. Hey, where were we? Okay. Okay, so this is a note. Come on, stop that. Stop moving around. <laughs> this is another note. Okay, so this is a pitch, and that's a pitch. So what I want to do here is I'm going to zoom in, and I'm going to change this to sa samples, right? And I'm going to measure from here to here. And that gives me 150. Oh, not, that's not right. I sh yeah, actually, that, this might work. So let's, let's do this. Let's do second, minutes and seconds. OK, so this is, it says right here, 0 0.003 seconds, right? Let's remember that. Let's go to this next pitch here and do the same thing. So we'll go from the beginning, from here, and it's hard to tell, right? I think here would be the next one. And that's 004, right? Because it's a different pitch. So the number of oscillations, the number of periods changes. For like so if something's A above middle C, that's vibrant, there's 440 of those oscillations per second. They occur at a frequency of 440 times per second. If it's an A, an octave lower, it vibrates at a frequency of 220 of those periods per second. So if you have a one second of time and there are 220 divisions, the space between the beginning of, of a period to the beginning of the next period is one length. But if it's something's vibrating at twice that speed, that length will be half as long. Right? So... These are just things to be aware of and to understand when you're looking at waveforms, what you're, what you're looking at. All right, so that's going to bring us to the end of today's class. It's just basically, uh, this is, I want you to start thinking about this a little bit and just put it in your mind that this is what's going on when we start mixing stuff, which will be the next, pro the next, the next, next project. Uh, we'll have a track, a couple of tracks that you'll I'll assign. You can pick one and mix it. Um, live instruments and stuff and um, we'll talk more about much more about this in much more detail as we get into that uh, any questions on any questions on today's material so in our on our timeline uh, in Google Cla Google 
classroom. Today's all the class material except for the PDF I uploaded is available for you to look at. Uh, the PDF I sent to you. And by tomorrow, I'll put on the timeline what the exact assignment is uh, for you. And it'll be, but, but just remember, you have to make four structure instruments, structure-free instruments. So you should be capturing sounds and you should be listening to sounds around you and capturing those. And those should be edited and ready to go by next week. And then there'll be either one week or two weeks to finish your composition. All right. Uh, so I'll pop that in tomorrow and this video <clears throat> and feedback for your homework work will be up shortly. I'll get to that in the next day or two. And this will be up on YouTube in the next day or two. Give me one sec. I'm loving the mic mute. That's like my favorite thing, <laughs> especially with the amount of beverage I have to drink to keep my mouth, my voice from being too dry. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate you being here. And have a great weekend and stay safe out there. Don't get sick, please. And do your best. And I will catch you on the next one. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pete.